Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The me and team. Ed Jin. With guest co-hosts. Oh, sure. Magma Dragoon. Dan Q. Mad J. Asked and received. I'll remember the pause in between. Oh, right. Welcome to episode 215, featuring Dan Q. Asked and received. Mad Jin. This is the pause in between. Makalua. I think I need more caffeine for the pause in between. Alpha Show Show all the d- bugs. And Magma Dragoon. I will try not to be disruptive. What? Here. No, 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 no. The whole point of here is being disruptive. If we start talking too much, just butt right in. Oh, okay. Uh, an announcement here. Scott. Yes. You are now the most frequent guest co-host on Polycast. This is your ninth appearance, a new show record. Congratulations. <gasps> he beat MLS. Yep. <laughs> or condolences. Your first appearance was in August 2009 during our third season, episode 73. So how do I phrase this nicely? You're old. All right. First topic. <laughs> also, Dan Q was doing this show long before you showed up as an... <laughs> So <laughs> how old is Dan? That is completely irrelevant. <laughs> He's the it's eldest. Relevant. Is it entirely relevant? He started this whole thing. He's the eldest. Um. Stay <laughs> <laughs> on the show. <laughs> Let's move on from this. this is... <laughs> oh, oh, so taking getting uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, I was trying to, you know, help some other people, and this this is what I get for it. I tell you what. <laughs> this is good stuff. Beyond Earth will be completely different as of sometime when they actually release a patch. Apparently the dev have decided to go in and uh, not just do a small patch, but for fixing the technical issues that we already talked about last time. But gameplay-wise, they are going to implement changes to many, many systems. A lot of it would be stuff like exploit fixing. Hopefully this will be a slightly more polished game by the time this patch comes out. But at least we'll have something different sometime in the future. You know, there was a lot of people constantly complaining about what's going on. So I don't know if it was due to the complaints, but uh, there's nothing specific in here. It's like implementing leader sponsor trait balance pass. They gave four sponsor names, Kozlov, Barre, Ronaldo, and Elodi. So four of them look like they're going to change, as well as some seated start options. So they don't say what the changes are because they may not know what the inevitable answer to that is, but at least for the moment they know that they're changing it. Implemented overall unit balance path, so strength production, blah, 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 blah. Adjusted certain virtues, implementing a balance pass on the health system, something I think pretty much everybody has agreed that was a bit of an issue, so penalties and bonuses are changing. Revisiting difficulty level scaling, increasing difficulty when playing on Apollo. When they say revisiting difficulty level scaling, and then they mention increasing difficulty when playing on Apollo specifically, I would assume that the second sentence is part and parcel with the first sentence. So maybe they just mentioned it specifically because people have been, quote unquote, griping about how easy it is on Apollo. Because you could also interpret it as we're revisiting difficulty level scaling by increasing difficulty when playing on Apollo. Forget about the other difficulty levels. Yeah, well, I wouldn't use the word difficulty level scaling, those three words together, if they were only changing Apollo. That's just me. I think that's... they are specifically highlighting for the people who have been complaining that, yes, we're going to make Apollo more difficult for you. Yeah. All right. And hopefully, when they adjust affinity reward ramping and other affinity-based words in these patch notes, that means that some of those quests of the affinity ones that you can never complete because they make no sense... Do Biofuel have... plant on your inland capital. Yay! Uh, <laughs> hopefully, they will fix stuff like that. Then there's the whole adjusting station distribution and arrival time. Uh, does that mean they will stay a certain amount of hexes away from other civilizations and actually be stations out in the middle of nowhere instead of stations exactly where I wanted to put my second city? No. No, I think that means there's just going to be more stations and they're going to be closer to where you want to settle. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trolling. I don't know. Yeah. It'll be a wall around you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's just like Civilization 1 when a civilization would settle a city right beside yours. Hey, <laughs> they're going retro. Yeah. 
Apparently, they improved the AI, including energy management, tactical management, tech, and victory approaches, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, improving AI, full stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it needs work. Oh, one thing that was bothering people, the achievement's not firing if max turns was set in a previous game. <laughs> or if it wasn't set. Yeah, or if it was yeah. set. Achievement's just not firing because derp. The rest of the stuff was from previous patch notes. It's also worth pointing out that when we were talking about this on the last episode, it was just general things that they were looking at, not specific patch notes. And for multiplayer, previously they said investigating reports of potential multiplayer stability issues. And I believe Mackie's response was, potential? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now... <laughs> Did I get the affectation correct? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and now, as part of multiplayer, correcting multiple desyncs and investigating a crash due to content mismatch is the first one. The third one is increasing geographic range of server browser distance filter. But just the second one, ongoing multiplayer improvements. Mm. Good. So you investigated reports of, and now we know from the patch notes that there are ongoing multiplayer improvements. Increasing the geographic range of server browser distance filter. To translate that into other type of words, you were constantly only getting the local people <laughs> when you went to search for a multiplayer game. <laughs> like so, if I went and searched, I would only get Texas. <laughs> or U.S. or something like that. Yeah. yeah, you'd get a short range versus worldwide. Which certainly explains why when you go to look for a list of available multiplayer matches and then you compare it with, say, Civilization Five at the same time and the number of people who are actively playing... Yeah. You think, how come there's so few for Beyond Earth and not for Civ Five? Do I, you know, what, what's Where'd going on? Where to go? So, yeah, that seems to be something that they're working on there. I didn't even think that, although now in hindsight, oh, that's probably what was going on. I just thought more and more people were sending their games to private because they didn't <laughs> want to play with strangers. <laughs> well, yeah. that's probably also true. <laughs> <laughs> Warning you to ask in the chat, estimated patch date? And I responded, no estimated patch date at present, and it's Fuzzy Fractal 42. And both these individuals, past guests on Polycast, by the way, he's like, soon, trademark. Yep, that, that's, <laughs> yep. that's the new release date. Soon, trademark. It's just as soon as the Linux version comes out. <clears throat> It'll come out on Valve time. Oh, my gosh. Was that a segue, Majin? Impressive. Yeah, and then uh, Mackie wrote it. <laughs> A Civilization, Beyond Earth, Mac, and Linux dev update, and they have about four of them, where they go over various bugs, graphical and mechanical, game-wise, in the game. They're you know, showing that they're aware of these issues. They're constantly pointing out the same thing. Like I saw from the first update, where they're pointing out some graphical glitch issues, to the fourth update, where they're still pointing out graphical glitch issues. <laughs> like, okay, we get it. These four updates, so since late October, been published by the e-commerce content and community manager at Aspire Media. Huh? Russ Looney. That that is his title, e-commerce content and community manager. Okay. Uh, yeah, they focus on graphical issues. It's been focused on multiplayer as well as leader issues. Worthwhile noting, this is maybe a bit more for uh, Modcast, but we'll, I'll mention it here. In the second update, happy to announce that Civilization Beyond Earth on Mac will support mods via the Steam Workshop, but they're still evaluating to see if they can do on the same as Linux. It's noted that the Linux team follows the lead of our Mac team, so these updates are primarily focused on the development of the Mac versions. Uh, the Mac version, the biggest hurdles are first on Mac. Well, yeah, as much as the game core is in C++, C++ on the PC is very different than C++ on the Mac when it comes to implementation stuff. So there's usually a big problem. They do say as part of the latest update, though, that for the Mac, and that's for both Steam and Mac App Store versions, have been submitted for approval. Assuming all goes well, our Mac users could be colonizing new planets by next week. Address the uh, leader issue the leader animation issue. But the latest on multiplayer, since we've heard some about multiplayer on the PC, actually more about a Civ 5 multiplayer issue that we addressed in passing on the last episode. But on this developer update for the Mac, they say we've made a lot of progress. Whereas previously out of sync rates for cross-platform games could be as high as 25 to 30 times per game, the rate is now closer to 7 to 10. Okay? And they've said, for those who will be setting up multiplayer games in the future, we've noticed that ping can be an important factor, which probably isn't a surprise. Okay. However, playstyle also seems to have an effect. For example, the warmonger types may see more out-of-sync issues than someone who prefers to turtle up and build out infrastructure. We saw that even in Civilization V, particularly in the later game. It's like, oh, out-of-sync, who just took a city? Yeah. You? Me? Bueller? Bueller. 
do say it's still an unfortunate issue that exists, but there's very little we can do at the moment until updates are made by the Windows PC developer, <laughs> even though they don't mention the name of the Windows PC developer specifically. Yeah, it's all their fault. Uh, <laughs> and, well, okay, so the Windows version is not exactly multiplayer stable either. I do also say that the Linux version is about two to three weeks behind yeah. the Mac version, but that it is also coming along nicely, quote-unquote. Honestly, I think these developer updates are just an attempt to give those looking for a Mac and or a Linux version news that we on the PC platform have been enjoying for a while because it's often, well, Publisher 2K would say, well, there's a Mac and Linux version and it's coming. Mm. And then we hear nothing, 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 months go by. Hey, it's been released. Oh. Yeah, well, because originally 2K said it'll be released on both platforms at the same time. And then Asper went, yeah, about that. Polycast Ask and Ye Shall Receive Contest. Back in October, just to remind people, or for those who didn't know, we asked people to ask questions of uh, Civilization Beyond Earth developer for Axis Games, and with the opportunity to uh, win some limited edition game swag. Ooh. We, Polycast regular co host myself, Mackie, uh, the present absent me and team, and Majin, we compiled a top 10 as I described a show tr- show's tradition, and we forwarded it on to the developer for answering. The answers uh, were provided by the co-lead designers from Civilization Beyond Earth, again at Fraxis, Will Miller and David McDonough. So we are going to go through uh, those 10, starting with, guess what, number 10. If you could go back in time to the start of the development of the game, what would you do differently and why? From Graspy. Dave says, I would not have gone to E3, so I wouldn't miss the birth of my first child. Other than that, we couldn't be happier with how Beyond Earth turned out. It was a great effort from the entire studio. Also, time travel scares us. Understandable. (laughs) As it should. Number nine. Uh, Would you consider adding alien sieves in an expansion or as a DLC? This is a question by Carl5872. Doesn't say who actually answered this, but we want Beyond Earth to be a story about humanity. It's a story of hope and redemption. We like the dynamic that is created <laughs> by the, when the factions leave Earth and pioneers and find a new home on the alien planet. I think it would be cool for a faction to make contact with intelligent life, hence the contact victory, but putting an intelligent alien up front and center might lift the veil and miss the point of our game story. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, the story that plays out is squish everyone. <laughs> well... I mean, you, you could have the aliens as DLC. It's just you're contacting other aliens. Yeah, it's not you. Like, oh, we met these aliens, but you're not good enough. <laughs> it's not like all aliens are the same. Number eight. With regards to future content, will we see the ocean get more fleshed out in terms of xeno life and resources? As it stands, the ocean tiles feel rather empty, save for the occasional sea dragon and kraken doesn't say who answered it, but the answer is, the ocean was a very difficult part of the map to play with. We wanted to make a very cool alien terrain, and we think we succeeded with that. However, you can push the alienness of your terrain so far until it becomes completely unreadable to the player. In the case of the ocean, many of our ideas for alienizing the water conveyed the wrong idea. We wanted the water to still read as transversible terrain, but what do you think of when you see green water in a video game? Harmful acid. Yellow water, the kiddie pool. If we change the texture of the water, then we no longer have water at all. As it stands, the water is the most Earth-like element of the game and is something we are still looking for a creative solution to make distinct. I, I liked the wit they did with the ocean because it looked very gray to me instead of blue. Yeah, and for all we know, it's liquid something else, and that's why you can't have ships right off the bat. Yeah. Mm, yeah. There's a reason that you can't put a ship in that stuff. It ain't water. <laughs> that's right. The planet. You see, you're, you're trying to contact the planet. The planet has to have somewhere to put stuff. Yeah, there's, there's many Ew. forms. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that question came to us from Semperfy2382. <laughs> Number seven. This one's from Valation. How much attention do you give to fan site communities like Civ Fanatics during the development process, both pre- and post-launch, and has this had any influence on Beyond Earth? Answer, we'd be doing Civ a disservice if we didn't pay attention to our communities. We have a lot of people out there who are incredibly passionate for our games and play them for hundreds of hours. They play the game more than we can, so it's obvious they're going to have meaningful things to say. Yeah, because we play a lot Did of... Did anyone else... Think free play testing? <laughs> Well, I was thinking hundreds of hours, lightweight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? I <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Only <laughs> hundreds? 
What's up, Ayas? What's that mean? Yeah, and, and there's sometimes when they play, they're looking for specific things or trying to go to a specific goal point, whereas we're just playing and we'll come across the most random bugs that if they had played hundreds of hours for playtesting, they never would have found. No, I don't think it has anything to do with that anyways. Just think about have they listen to the community pre or post launch and I would like to bring up Adept Blue, the free tech from Adept Blue. That was definitely a major concern on the forums pre launch and it did get modified pre launch. Plus the startup options, the randomizing of your seating that was brought up on the forums and it got added pre launch along with some other balance changes and stuff like that. So I would basically just take it as a point that yes, they do pay attention to the fan site communities, both pre and post launch. And it has influenced Beyond Earth. Yes, we know that they're going to try and increase Apollo difficulty. And that they've got a whole list of other balanced things because now we've put in a few hundred hours, thousands of hours collectively. And we're like, um, can you need to balance this just a little bit more? I should not be able to do this. Covert operations, we're looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, and no, this is not my double login, from one crazy Canadia. <laughs> <laughs> the way units now upgrade seems very streamlined. For example, you do not have to upgrade old units into new ones anymore. What was the basis of this gameplay decision? Was it based on narrative, multiplayer, or just a simple design choice? The answer, it was both a thematic decision as well as a design choice. Speaking thematically, we see the future of technology as having more uniformity. The game takes place at a point where humans have the ability to make advanced tech and produce it quickly. The design choice is made for accessibility as well. If you're creating a strong military presence, it's not incredibly fun to scroll around to make sure all of your units are at their highest tier. Number five, Warpig asks... What is the process like when you decide to rework and expand a core game mechanic, like espionage? And the answer? Most Civ fans have probably heard something from the studio talk about our rule of thirds. One third of the game is changed, one third of the game is stuff carried over, and a third is new. When we approach a core game mechanic, it's a very similar process. We have to look at what works, what people didn't like, and what we can add. What all those things are changes depending on the mechanic and which Civ game is being developed. Yeah, basically it was a non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, so he asked about the process, and they just said, here, one-third, one-third, one-third rule. How, and we decided we, how we were going to apply that in Beyond Earth, yeah? Yeah, they didn't actually talk about it. No. I think okay. he wanted a more detailed breakdown there, guys, but, you know, yeah. only so much they're allowed to say. Or an example. Yes. This is how we change this. And by more detailed breakdown, you don't mean the dance move, of course. Of course. That would be especially bad on our show since we're audio only. Mm, Speaking about breaking down. (laughs) Yeah, number four. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This question comes from uh, T. Penguilin. We know that Kozlov is essentially representative of Yuri Gagarin, but who were some of the other interesting inspirations for the sponsor leaders? And the answer to that is no other leader was as inspired by a real personality like Kozlov was. They're based on a combination of art and design ideas for how to embody the character of the faction. This is echoed in how we designed the look of our affinities. While the idea of supremacy sentient robot armies may sound familiar to sci-fi fans, the look of this and the two other affinities have a lot to do with simple shape and color. Supremacy uses a lot of triangles, sharp edges, cold colors to create a sleek look. Purity uses bulky shapes, squares, and predominantly a red color scheme to emphasize power of this affinity. Am I even reading the answer to the same question? The question was not about affinities. It's like they went off oh. on a tangent like I do sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, the question, yep, they answered it, and then they went off on a tangent. The, okay, to finish it up, anyways. Finally, Harmony uses curved circular shapes with a green blue hue to give us affinity. Yeah, the question was, did you inspire things for other leaders? The answer is no. And then there's some discussion about the affinity. Here's some fun other design <laughs> stuff to tide you ever since we really yeah. didn't. Well, yeah, because they said it, it, it was based on a combination of art and design ideas, like we designed affinities. Now let's talk about affinities. Yeah. Okay. So it's starting to, <laughs> we took up more than half the answer. I was starting to get confused that I like randomly went to the wrong page. And but uh, I like knowing how they did that with the affinities. Yeah, that's nice. But and you know what? Why don't we view this as they answered an eleventh question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bonus. Question number three from Lord Tyrion. Seeing how the latest civilization installment, Civ B, is all about the future and aimed at presenting an optimistic, inspired take on it, what are your favorite stories about civilization or another practice game like Alpha Centauri inspiring somebody with a friend, fam, fan? The answer is, one of our favorite pieces of fan mail was actually one of the first letters we received after our announcement of PAX East. It's a bittersweet letter from a teacher in the UK who loves Civ and misses his childhood. 
started playing Civ when he was about 10, and now he teaches students the same age. He talks about having most of his time being taken up by important adult duties, which is something we can understand. He says his one bastion of childhood has always been the Civilization series, and he couldn't be more excited about Beyond Earth. We've had the letter posted on our studio since the day we received it. It helps us remember just how important Civ is for our fans. And yeah, I played it in my childhood too, so I, I can relate. Yeah, my reaction was, oh Yeah. Ew. Question was from M15A. There are a lot of new mechanics in Beyond Earth, such as the tech web, that are particularly well suited to the game's sci-fi setting. But is there any new Beyond Earth mechanic that you'd be interested to see in a core historical civilization game? Well, the answer was, we're very happy with the systems in Beyond Earth. One that we could potentially see returning to a historic Civ game is the orbital system. Like architects in Civ V, do they mean great people there? Actually, do they mean archaeologists? I think so. Maybe yeah. so. Now that I think yeah. about that, yeah. Because when I first read that, I was like, eh? Anyway, yeah. satellites wouldn't be available from the get-go, but once you get to the modern era, they would come into play. Launching just one satellite and beyond Earth brings in a whole new layer of strategy. You have to think about timing and the effect of the satellite. Not to mention that it's fun to salvage wreckage when it comes crashing down. And I think it's important to uh, clarify this person's username. When, when Mackie said M15A, that's the letter A, not E-H, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Only Canadian would need to clarify that. Number one, from New Earth Relic. The tech web feels like it uh, front loads a lot of the player work because of the abundance of options early. Eight first tech options versus Civ V's four choices. And shallow trees requiring you to know more techs at each decision point. What are your thoughts on how Beyond Earth's learning curve compared to previous games? Did you plan on the curve being different? The answer. We wanted the alien nature of Beyond Earth to permeate both through the setting and some of the gameplay. We wanted it to feel distinct from previous Civ games. Your people are at a completely different place at turn zero in Civ V and Beyond Earth. In Civ V, you're at the beginning of mankind. You're starting from scratch in terms of both the materials you have and what you know of the world. You don't know what fire is. You have to create language and communication. You have to discover the basics. In BE, you're a pioneer who is more advanced than modern-day man. You know how to make a settler, soldiers, and your people know how to survive, but you don't have the materials to do it. Those additional tech choices represent the decision. You know what that stuff is and what it can do for you, but you need to prioritize what you want to figure out first. While it might be true that you have more ways to go from your initial early options, you do have multiple paths to get to those second and third ring techs on the web, precisely because we wanted players to have the ability to transverse that web through different pathways through different games. We have tried to balance the learning curve with the idea of exploring a wide-open technological future. First game I played and I opened that up, I was like, um, what, who, where? Uh, which way I go? Yeah, you don't know until you've played a few games. Third place to you, Lord Tyrion, a Beyond Earth lush biome poster. In second place, M15A, you receive your choice of either a Sivanon or Penny Arcade Expo exclusive diplomatic shirt. And in number one, New Earth Relic, you receive a Phyraxicon swag bag, which is a Beyond Earth backpack, keychain, mouse pad, an XCOM dog tag, and shot glass. Given the Beyond Earth patch notes, are some of these things going to change in the near to nearish future? Yes, it will, based on some things that have been specifically said in the patch note about improving X, Y, and Z, or Z if you prefer. But until such a time as we get to that point, in terms of playing it now, and the initial play since the game was released almost a month ago as of this recording. This is about the seeding options, starting with best colonist, and we don't mean, is it Herman? Is it Ethel? No, 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 no. We don't mean an individual colonist. We mean the best benefit as a group of type of colonists. You gave us a link for two different polls, and it's pretty much the same in both polls. Is yeah. Artist so. leads by this huge margin, which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was sitting there thinking that was kind of odd, because I keep going for aristocrats, because I can lean on that extra energy and health. And it keeps me out of trouble and from going bankrupt and having my units disappear. For me, at least, that's a little more valuable than the extra culture. I still get the health, and there are other oh, ways I, think... I can get the culture. And there's plenty of the quests that add culture to your buildings, so it doesn't seem as critical. To me, to me, it seems more critical because it's kind of hard to get that culture. There's very few buildings that give culture, and the health apparently can be ignored. You just go spamming cities and not yeah. really care <laughs> negative health. Once it goes over 20 <laughs> negative, it just doesn't matter anymore. It's still negative. <laughs> Yep. You're not going to yeah. dig yourself out of that hole, and there's no... What is the effect? Is at that point it's still only like negative 10% growth? Ooh. Well, there's negative 10% growth, then negative 10% Well, science. yeah, but still... Yeah, 
All those things can be uh, overcome by virtues that give you plus 10%. Yeah, and the virtues, if you go down to the knowledge tree, there's the one that makes them cost less. And it's like, now that I've started doing that, it's like, what culture problems? But the reason why artists get further ahead than aristocrats is people still value culture more than uh, the energy side of things. So even if you're going taller, that extra culture means more virtues faster. If you go artists, you can have that free colonist from pioneering in 19 turns on standard speed, give or take. Yeah, and the free worker before that. Yeah. Well, no, I just go straight to the uh, free colonist. I ignore the worker. But you can do that very fast, which means very fast second city, very means yada, yada, yada. Speed of virtue acquisition is pretty big. And the fact that it has the extra health, because even if you're going to ignore health, having health at the beginning is useful so your yeah. cities grow for the first bit. And frankly, if you go prosperity, you, you can get like an insane amount of health. Yeah, where you get the, eventually the minus 25% negative health. I mean, I don't know that's later in that virtue, but isn't there something else before? Oh, the plus seven. Yeah, well, yeah. the plus one per city once you hit 10, which you can do at, if you line it up right. You can take your 10th prosperity choice at the same time as you're taking uh, Eudomania and getting the minus 25% on health. So plus one health from city for a sponsor, plus plus one health from prosperity, plus the two other plus one health per city, and then basically ignore unhealth per city. You can ICS with that and just spam health buildings in your cities to uh, get healthy again. Even by the end of the game, I find like my cities are getting at most, even with bio wells and a couple paddocks, like 40 culture. So plus two is a lot more than, for something that I have 40 of, is a lot more than like plus three energy when I have 150 energy from every city or 150 production from every city. And the other thing I find is right from the bat, you can be constructing generators to give yourself yep. mm-hmm. energy. And then you get your first satellite, and that's going to increase the energy output for the uh, time that it's in orbit. I'm not feeling the loss of the plus three energy because I can relatively make that up pretty quickly as compared to trying to, quote unquote, make up for the culture that I would not be getting otherwise at the start. I mean, I would rank aristocrats second yeah. after artists. Because of the health. You know, I could ping back and forth between those two things. Ha! <laughs> ping! But, uh, yeah, I would vote for artists in this as well. Yep. As best. The person who started the thread, by the way, Mao Teribaki 2, had said that, I find them all attractive apart from aristocrats, as energy isn't that useful in the early game. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> back up. I, instant buying buildings when you first reach them. Instant buying extra troops. Um, energy's pretty useful. Mm-hmm. And then he does make the comment that, yes, artists and their ability to help pump out virtues quickly, on the other hand. Okay, yep, so I agreed with half of what he had to say there. Full options, other than for artists and aristocrats, was plus two science from scientists, plus three food from refugees, and plus two production from engineers. Artists have a commanding lead of almost 90%. And he also started the next seating option, best poll thread. And of course it has to be a poll thread because, you know, it was selected by me. <laughs> so we want to know what the best spacecraft is. Um, let's decide. I shall vote now. Beep. Clearly it's Enterprise. <laughs> oh, wait. That's another kind <laughs> yeah. of spacecraft. Not right? that kind of spacecraft. <laughs> oh, dang. Yeah. They should have Millennium Falcon, dang it. So. <laughs> spacecraft options are, of course, Continental Surveyor, so you can see all the coastline, retrograde thrusters, so you get wider area to choose, and a big site area to see where your second or third city are going to go. The tectonic scanner, and is it just me, or did he write that wrong? He did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's spelled correctly. Okay. Um, anyways, tectonic scanner, so you can see petrol, geothermal, and titanium right off the mark. Now, the fusion reactor for 100 energy. On standard. Yeah, on standard speed only. Or the life form sensor for revealing alien nests. And, of course, tectonic scanners are winning by mm-hmm. a huge margin. I don't have to research all this crap to know where the stuff is. I don't accidentally build a city on top of a geothermal source. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not winning like Artist was winning in the last poll at 90% plus, but it does have more than double anybody else. It's over 50%. 50.91%. Although, to be fair, it's probably not that as useful as people think it is because you research petrol right off the mark because you also want the production and the science from that tech. Uh, you, research titan- you research titanium really quickly because you want the fusion reactor and the combat rovers and stuff like that. So the only one it really shows you <laughs> is geothermal. And geothermal. But for the perfectionists in us, we like to know that we got the maximum amount of resources without accidentally settling on them. Yeah. I agree with um, Mackie. 
And I also wanted to add that this is mostly, the others are just so disappointing that this is the choice by default. Like, this is the best of the worst. I mean, yeah, but like, so far, every time I've pulled out retrograde thrusters, I think every single time I haven't really wanted to move further. Yeah, yeah. But the bigger point of retrograde thrusters was the fact that you could see so far out, you could see all your starting pickups, you could see anything that you want to build on, you could see where your second city might go. So even if you say, oh, well, right here where my capital is going to go, I don't really want to change the center spot, but if you see a great second uh, city, you might move your capital slightly so you can give that second city a little bit more space. Yeah, it, it, it's just as one of those things that, in theory, it's a great idea. In practice, it hasn't been as useful as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only time you ever want retrograde thrusters is the time that you choose anything but it and then realize that you really <laughs> want yeah, to pick exactly. one. <laughs> Because, I mean, there's yeah. times where I turned on the retrograde thrusters and there was better areas that I wish that I could put my capital at instead of the one that was going to be going to. And it just felt like defeating the purpose. Personally, retrograde thrusters is better. Though I have now used all of them for various reasons. Even Continental Surveyor is useful, especially for sea-based trade routes. Yeah, I was also going to say if you were going to play on the Archipelago or the Atlantean maps, it's also useful to find out where everybody in the islands are. <laughs> And it's just nah. like poking around in the dark. Yeah, it's not necessarily just the islands. Like I'll use it on the continents style map, the turn one. Even the Pangea style map, continental surveyor can be useful so you know where to go. Yeah. If there's little islands out there, you can know where to uh, yep. send your explorers. The Wintel Islands with the, the Xenomass well that ha where all the aliens are spawning from, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lifeform Sensors has its uses, especially if you're going to try and farm the uh, alien nests for science. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's one of those ones that you pick it and then you find out that all the uh, alien nests are on the other side of the planet. Yeah, the one time that was useful and kind of interesting is we were doing a team game. We we're all on the same team. So one person took the continental, one person took tectonic. I was the one that took the life form sensor. <laughs> and all the nests were right by me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, thanks. Oh, well, at least I know not to go that way with my settler. <laughs> What's the best spacecraft option? Instead of just one choice, let's take two or more. Yay. <laughs> Fusion reactor tends to be the worst possible choice out of all of them, but I have used it to good effect, especially if you're going to do the bioworker plan. If you're going to buy the worker up front, that 100 energy gets you there way quicker. Or if you start with pioneering and you build your trade depot, you can pick up strategy on the map and buy your first trade route rather than build it. For myself, I'm flipping back and forth between the tectonic scanner and the fusion reactor. I think before we, the game was released, I was saying, I think I'll probably go Fusion Reactor more than Tectonic Scanner, like a ratio of, you know, every three games I play, I'll start with Fusion Reactor twice and do the Tectonic Scanner once. And now it's kind of reversed just because of that 100 energy, that boost that that can translate into buying, quote unquote, whatever it is that you want earlier on more quickly. And that helps with the snowball effect. But I, I will give it as the best to Tectonic Scanner and really the only one that disappoints me completely, the only one that I would fail give it less than 50% to is actually the life form sensor. Yeah, it just depends on where the nests are. But I will say the better thing about this in terms of the best spacecraft option is it's not a blowout as compared to... <laughs> yeah, there's a few extra choices here. <laughs> what we just talked about for the colonists. Yep. Yeah, we got there's... three pretty good options. I mean, most of the options are useful based on the map you choose. <laughs> Especially with fusion reactors, I find that one, it completely depends on your other choices. So it depends on your colonists, it depends on your cargo choice and your sponsor, depending. So it's one of the ones that you can't look at it all by itself, see if it's useful or not. It depends entirely on the combination. Yeah, I could see taking pack and the free worker and then running out of tiles to improve and then using yes, that energy to rush by some tiles. And to extend that, uh, all these points actually about pending on the map, a star of hope is saying in the chat, I've only found tectonic scanner to be useful if I start next to titanium for instant production. The retrograde thrusters I have always found useful, partly because you can't see what will be in range if you move from the center hacks without. And I guess sometimes the wider area to choose start location. When I think of the map, I just think, yay, it reveals a bunch of canyons. Hmm. Oh, just depends. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Crap, I landed next to a mountain range. Welp. And the good nope. news about retrograde thrusters is if you choose it and you do happen to have a bunch of alien nests right next to you, you get to see them anyways without taking life form sensor. 
I mean, they won't trigger as nests on the map, but you'll see that there's Xenomass there, and you'll see that there's Miasma on the Xenomass, and you can make the logical conclusion that Xenomass plus Miasma equals a nest. So it's got extra benefits there. Mm -hmm. Star Hope wants to know, why do I hate canyons? Because my city can't work them and improve them, and they also... I only need one hex of canyon next to my city for a tectonic anvil. (laughs) Canyon arrow... I can get boxed into a corner, and so now I have to move my units around to long way. And, hey, look at that station over there. I want to connect. Oh, look at that. It's blocked by a canyon, and the only route around it is blocked by my asthma right now. Ah, great, thanks. (laughs) Cargo! (laughs) And not the pants. (laughs) (laughs) Although they're useful. But, yeah, that's another blowout one. Uh, uh, Free worker for everybody! It's like Yay. 79% when I'm looking at it, so. I usually go laboratory because I yeah. don't like having to check pioneering. <laughs> yeah, that's the other useful. If you have a specific plan in mind where you want to get that first settler out really fast, yep. then, yeah, laboratory. But I'm begin with the clinic, eh, hydroponics, I, eh. Yeah, I'm surprised anybody went for hydroponics. <laughs> <laughs> or the weapon arsenal. I mean, yeah, free, free soldiers. Sol- seriously, mm-hmm. you have a quest in the beginning where you build an outpost to get a free soldier out of that. Yep. Mm-hmm. So take pioneering and then go for the free colonists from the virtue that is, and then you get a free soldier. Plus, then there's the free soldiers from if you go with dogmatic engineering, you can get two free soldiers, and then there's other places <laughs> you can get free soldiers all over the place. The only use for free soldier, I would suggest, is if you knew there was a bunch of aliens next to you. But as long as you don't send your worker out into the wilds, aliens don't bother your worker. Yeah, and having those uh, extra turns to start with, with the worker, you'll start getting this faster and that faster. The city grows faster. You start checking faster. You know, it's it's such a turn advantage thing. Yep. Beginning with the clinic is kind of eh. Yeah, you do get the extra science. Yeah. You get the extra health, and you can get the extra health from the building quest sooner, so which means that you can get to a tech faster, which basically means you probably could have just took scientists. <laughs> but it's kind of like it's one less thing to build put into your queue so that can be useful in that respect beginning with pioneering not for the colonists but so you can get your trade rolling oh yeah you get production from the trade depot so it's not that bad building to get that early on yeah and you you'll can have set- that settler faster and then you will have a trade route to make that mm-hmm. outpost grow faster or a trade route out to somebody else that station that went where you wanted to put your city hey yes to confirm, the hydroponics gives you an extra population in your first city. I think that was the only one yep. that wasn't mentioned, the benefit it gives you. What's that going to take? Five turns? Woo. Yeah. yeah you know, uh... <laughs> this is the problem with the virtue for the plus two pop in your new outposts in Prosperity. If you don't have the hexes improved, you could starve that city down right and probably back. lose that pop. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it kind of depends on where you place yourself. If you want that extra pop in your first city, you therefore need to make sure that you have enough food near your first city. Man, I'm going to cause controversy, but hey, that's okay. That's what I do. In terms of best, and this is for a very specific combination of things, I do prefer the weapons arsenal. I'm going to explain why. I can send my explorer in one direction, and I can send my soldier in another direction to find things that either resource pods for them to move into, or maybe the soldier is now going to find a place where I can send an expedition, and then I move my explorer back. But the other thing I also like to do is I take the culture, I take the artists from the first seating option we talk about, and then, as it stands right now, if I go prosperity and I do the first tier, and then I can go right away, I can gain the free worker unit from the second one I can get, which is the workforce initiative and because i've taken the culture from the beginning i've given myself that push and i can go into prosperity and get that and i'm able to be exploring the map so i know better potential sites for future settlements get a better sense of where the aliens are but i also get a chance again to get to those resource pods and as well as those expeditions if i don't take the weapons arsenal then yes yes i would take the free worker but to me it's going prosperity and the fact that i can gain a free worker unit second tier off of prosperity combined with the culture that allows that exploration to just help me snowball hmm no 
<laughs> well, you're entitled to your opinion, but to me, it's just like, okay. And so are 105 other people who think that machine think is better. Are you crazy. <laughs> well, just because the majority of people think it's the best doesn't mean that it is the best. It's not a majority. That's an, it's an opinion. It's a super majority. It's a super majority? Yeah, well, I could name some rather extreme historical examples where the majority opinion was a very bad idea. So, I like the other thing that... Hey, I'm not saying the worker is a bad choice. For me, that would be the one that I would go to if I don't choose the free soldier. It's a very close second for me. I like what uh, Machin said a while ago, the tyranny of the majority. Democracy is the tyranny of the majority. Yeah. It's a lot. Okay, let's go on to the next subject. We're not, yeah, we're not going to agree on that front clearly, and that's fine. Let's talk about sponsors. Speaking of the majority being wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Throw down. Now, I'm with the majority here in this poll. What is Brasilia's... Uh... Plus 10% in melee combat. That's it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's better than plus 10% growth when you're happy. <laughs> I mean, it's really, plus really hard to get happy. Your capital is best for everybody. Yeah, I like trying to decide between franco Iberian and Paul Australia. I choose Powell because meh. Um... <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah, take that. Otherwise, Paul Australia is winning the uh, choice, the poll here at 30, 39%-ish. Yeah, plus two trade routes, good. Followed not very closely by Franco-Iberia, free tech every 10 virtues. Why is that not higher? I mean, seriously. (laughs) Followed by PAC, because PAC is good. Actually, I'm kind of surprised PAC isn't much higher. But then again, there's only 76 votes as compared to some of the other polls that had well over 100. So a few less people voted on this one, which means that it's spread out a bit more. And then, yeah, it starts getting uh, worse from there. So KP and ARC uh, have seven each. And then SF. And then POW in Brasilia. Well, Paul Australia is nice. The extra two trade routes are good. But yeah, Franco Iberia is definitely better than that. And the PAC is better than that. If you like wonders, anyways, and faster workers. Yeah, that's what we were talking about earlier. You run out of hexes to improve. The thread starter thinks that many of the wonders are worse than the ordinary buildings. Yeah, it's kind of true. I think Paul Australia is the best, but it's not the only good one. Yeah, no, it's true. Plus two trade routes available in the capital from the outset. You want to be going and getting your trade routes up and running as quickly as possible. And plus two for the capital. The only time that can be like, oh, crap, is when there's nothing immediately around you that you can reach because you've been blocked by miasma. In which case, okay, I guess I need to go out and settle so then I can get those trade routes up and going. It's an incentive and it's the snowball effect. Pan-Asian cooperative, not for the plus 10% production towards wonders, but plus 25% worker speed. Okay, because that's also the snowball effect. Get that capital up and running, get greater population. Yeah, and if ARC gets something additionally for the early game, because you don't get into covert ops until a good bit later, then I would probably rate ARC higher, too. I'd put ARC at, like, middle tier. Yeah, yeah I think it if, could if be if higher, too. I think if espionage <laughs> wasn't broken, the ARC would be a lot better. Uh, ARC's better now, because it is broken. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for ARC, I mean, just because they're 25% faster, you get more kicks at the can. Yeah, exactly. You kick the can faster, and you get more intrigue out of it. Obviously, as others on the forums have realized, that uh, when you are stealing science, if you choose the most expensive tech on the turn that you're going to steal the science, your amount of beakers from Covert Ops comes based on that tech, and you get basically a quarter of it. So if you line up a bunch of steel techs, you can steal a very expensive tech very easily. And ARC gets to do that faster than everybody else. Not to mention the silliness where you can coup everybody's capital just by establishing networks. People in the poll, I think they're undervaluing the Slavic Federation. First orbital unit grants a free technology boost, and they stay in orbit 20% longer. So, okay, the thing we were talking about before, hey, let's just get some generators up, and I go ahead and I launch my first orbital unit, and hey, that's giving me a boost to that energy output from that generator. Mm. Do I want that longer? Yeah, of course I want Nah, I think you're overvaluing that. The free tech is a free tech, and it's going to go away. Then you're just stuck with your orbital units, and orbital units, they're okay, but they're not great. And everybody's problem with the SF longer time in orbit thing is the fact that uh, miasmic repulsors and basically anything that's meant for a short time to remove things like miasmic repulsors removing miasma also stay in orbit longer which (laughs) makes it worse defeat the purpose but then again everything else for orbital units is all based on staying up longer is better so the vast majority of orbital units do benefit from it but eh, orbital units you could play the entire game and not use them I do like the solar collectors, though. If you get a lot of those up, you get a lot of extra energy. Exactly. Yeah. 
But Franco Iberia's free tech every 10 virtues. If you push your culture, you can get way more free tech out of that. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying Franco Iberia is better. I'm just saying people are undervaluing Slavic Federation. In terms of the best, I realize you can only choose one. Yeah. But I think people are undervaluing it as all. Well. Yeah. People undervalue Brasilia. Now, Kavitha Protectorate. Um, I... I like the KP, especially after it got changed before release. Just mass spam of culture tiles. See, if you had KP and the pack get together and have a combined start, that would be awesome because KP gets so many culture tiles that they can't keep up with the workers. And they have pack with all the workers. <laughs> can't get enough culture tiles. See, those two just work well together. Cavith and Protectorate, Cities and Outposts acquire new tiles twice as fast. Mm-hmm. Especially if you throw artists in there. KP upper middle tier only because, okay, you gain new tiles twice as fast, but it very much depends on what are those tiles. What's the terrain like that you got around yourself? It could be, oh, I've got more tiles that, you know, I can't do anything with. Um, depends. That's the depends part. That's why upper middle tier for me. More is always better. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's a scale of better. It was okay, so you now have the tile. The question is, what can you do with it beyond having it? If it's something you can do it with it, you can improve it, and then it helps you, okay. But it's not always going to be the case. Mm, yes. You could also go Slavic Federation and take your uh, ridiculously early battle suits and get a whole lot of extra tiles by conquering everyone else's cities. Yes, there's that too. Sponsors-wise, yeah, there's some good, some bad. Apparently four of them are changing, including the SF, Franco-Iberia, Brasilia, and POW. The two that are changing are two of the considered worst and two of the are considered best. Well, one considered closer to best. Not in Australia, though. So, <laughs> or at least that we don't know that it's changing. They only named four of the eight. But then again, they did mention that trade routes are changing. So maybe Paul Australia is just going to get changed based on that. Recorded for episode 214 with Dan Q, Makalua, the main team, Mad Jin, and Teprock. The panel is by uh, Lena Brink. For a change, I got something reasonably easier to pronounce that's not always appreciated. <laughs> Speaking in tongues and how to accurately portray the different cultures. And it was about language. I was a gamer in Germany, and we have localized versions in Germany. You get a German version, play the game, and you realize sometimes they get it wrong in games. Yeah, all your base belong to us. And, um, so they get it wrong in German, too. And you get annoyed, and you ask yourself, like, it's not that hard. You know, I speak German fluently. How can it be hard? Do they just not care what's going on? Then I worked in localization QA for a while, almost four years playing the German version, figuring out what's not quite right. And again, your job now is to tell the developers, yeah, you got that wrong for linguistic reasons, so language-wise it's just wrong, or for cultural reasons, like that wouldn't resonate with German gamers, you might want to change that. And then I got to be a producer, <laughs> and now I'm kind of in charge of getting it right and figuring out what's so hard about it and why it isn't always possible to get it quite right. That's where the motivation to actually do this talk comes from. So what is the challenge? For civilization series specifically, we've always portrayed very different cultures worldwide, and that's part of what Civ is. It's one of the cores of the civilization series, having these different characters and these different cultures portrayed. It's really important to that game. The immersion for those audiences really depends on getting that right. What I thought was most interesting as I was watching through that was that difference between the difficulty in finding people who can translate at all for certain uh, nations and then the difficulty of making them immersive and how those tend to be inverted. Let's say you are doing civilization and you have this list of civilizations you want to do. You have a limited amount of time to complete the full project and you start researching into the cultures. Figuring out the exact way the actor needs to sound is just not very feasible. So what makes them expert is really where they were born the culture they grew up with, the language they grew up with. And it goes beyond language as well. It goes into cultural aspects. We try, and to me personally, it's really important to get it right just because I grew up getting annoyed at devs that get it wrong. But it's not 
really possible. At least not all languages and cultures. We're quite good at getting America right, for example, <laughs> because we have a lot of experts in the studio directly. But the further out it goes, the harder it gets. The level of expertise, just resting it on one person is again tricky because they only represent a certain crosscut of that country. They are not getting anywhere near representing the whole country. And I hope you would all agree that you would not want to be the one person, well, maybe want to, but not necessarily feel like you are the crosscut of all of your country. Just like I appreciated the part about when they said they would bring in the voice performers to read the lines, they didn't just want them to read the lines and leave. They wanted them to provide feedback. Yes. It really depends. They are often used to jobs where they are asked to just give the lines and not comment, please. In our case, since it's often native speakers, at least for the leaders, we ask them to please, please comment. They are kind of an expert. So it's more of a working session and not just a recording session. Because sometimes it's not just what you say, but it's also how you say it. The first step, finding translators and actors who actually speak that language. The second step is selecting the right dialect, voice, and dialogue, so that players from those cultures that we're portraying buy into these characters. Finding translators and actors. This can be quite a challenge. As you can probably imagine, if, if you look at Civ 5, and you just look at some of the Civs we had in Civ 5. Now to the other part. How hard can it be to not break immersion for lots of players? Suddenly, the languages that everybody speaks are really hard to get right because you have all these experts in the audience. So how expert is the audience really? Very. I didn't study linguistics. I'm not that good at languages. I speak the languages of the countries I lived in because practice, but I'm not a linguist. So it's not education as such. Yeah, her comment that everyone who speaks a language is kind of an expert is, was pretty interesting and, uh, and pretty accurate. And some people might say, uh, I know people who speak my language and they're an expert at absolutely nothing. Well, <laughs> certainly in that particular space at that particular time, they are the expert and they are an expert in the sense that they speak the language. So they have their own take and interpretation and experiences and feelings on that. That's certainly better to be able to have a conversation like that with someone as opposed to, I think, just trying to figure it out for yourself based on what you have read or even what you listen to and watch, because then you can target your questions specifically. And then you can also have the discussions in context in terms of, well, this is the character. This is what they're saying. They probably maybe even given some of the voice performers some of the uh, backstory that was disclosed to help them give a more informed answer. And keep in mind, the people doing the voice acting do tend to have good fluency in their language. We're not talking about people who have no fluency in any language, which do exist, but they're very useful for input, potentially. We have a publisher, an international publisher. We have offices. Tukey has offices. Germany, in England, in South America, like everywhere in the world, basically. So we start and um, check with those offices. They are always a great resource to just go to and say, like, hey, gut check, what do you think? That was specifically important now for Beyond Earth as well. We try to portray this well, civilization beyond Earth is in the future. So we're trying to portray where the Earth moved from here and where the cultures moved from here. And one of the important things in this is language. We can transport a little bit of history of Earth by um, messing with the languages a little <laughs> bit. Lena also talks about Frankenstein. Ooh. A testing group. Some of you have probably heard of that. Secret bee testing group we've had for years and years. Some of those members live abroad, and it's a great resource to have. These guys get early access to the game and play it and give us feedback, and they are really good at analyzing our games. But having some of them be from different areas of the world, that's really great to have in that early stages. A game gets announced at a certain point, and there's the PR campaign, so you can't just go and ask for help from the public um, two years in advance or something. It's just not possible. So having the Frankenstein members, this testing group members, um, give us feedback has been really valuable. They've been very involved in Beyond Earth as well in that respect. Yeah, and then the last step, which is <laughs> that we check the forums when the game goes live. We do that anyways, just to see what's coming up, any problems, anything we need to fix, what exploits are the people finding. We have a really smart fan base, and they find ways to beat that game that 
we didn't think of basically every time. But part of this is also checking what is the reaction from the territories where we actually have leaders. So for example, Germany, how do they respond to Bismarck in terms of when it goes about Civilization V? I think when you see the title, Speaking in Tongues, Adapting Civilization for a Global Audience, I must admit when I first read that title, I didn't immediately think of language. I thought, adapting it for a global audience. Okay, so this is how how do we market and how do we make money? Although certainly I think (laughs) doing this justice certainly speaks to that. If we had taken George Washington and taken an Australian actor to do voice (laughs) acting for him, Every American would have been, what the? (laughs) One person is an incredible asset to have. But again, that one person comes from one region, comes from one background. You know, one country isn't just homogenous, homogenous, (laughs) homogeneous. I'm German. Um, (laughs) Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. There's somebody else who has a particular number that is worth pointing out. I pointed out Scott's uh, record-breaking guest appearance, Mackie. Mackie's old? What? No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Mackie, welcome to the 200 Club. That's 200 episodes of Polycast that you've appeared on. Oh, dear. And this is Mackie's 200th episode of Polycast. Everyone dance. Well, Yay. it's just not a video podcast. I can't see your flailing. Yay. Mackie, you've been here for 200. Now what? Don't anybody say something about 200 more. more. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mackie joins only me in the 200 plus cup. This is my 212th episode. We'll get you yet, Madgen. Yeah, right. Not for Phil. <laughs> yeah, well, I, if Phil keeps taking time off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Phil misses one episode. <laughs> Cheapers. He's not here. He would expect us to troll him and just talk him. Come on. This is yeah, true. That's, tr- that's true. Phil has a few extra years worth of playcast. He's probably at least a good 100 ahead, maybe. He's at 127. Versus my fight. This is your 57. 57? Yep, 57. Yeah, he's got a lot of time to make up. You're fourth now. You're ahead of uh, Anna Lee and Imran. Ooh. Actually, I'm glad we pointed this out, because Imran was on 56 episodes, so because this is your 57th, this is also a milestone for Madge, and you are now the fourth most frequent regular co-host on the show. Uh, okay. And we're not referring to Bell. <clears throat> now I have to pick off everybody else. So there's three, three people ahead of me, and how do we get you to stop being on the show? <laughs> wow, how did they kill Dark all of a sudden? <laughs> I know where you... We suddenly went to, there can be only one mode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know where you live. This has been podcast episode 215. We've been joined by our host, Dan Quick. Now best dressed. Makalua. I don't even know what to say right now. <laughs> and now Mackie's like, I'm going to do the opposite and not say a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Temporary uh, co-host, Alpha Shark, me, and our special guest, Dragoon. Nailed it. <laughs> Hashtag not really. Scott being the most frequent guest co-host, the power has gone to his head to think that he can elevate a polycast guest to a special guest. <laughs> I don't know. What's up with that? And now he's a temporary guest. He did describe himself yeah. as temporary, yes. He did. Well, I didn't know what else to say. I'm trying to do the closing. I don't have a text copy thing. <laughs> and now we're trolling. It's so good. Uh, and by the way, I was here too, just in case anybody was wondering. I already said your name. No, you didn't. If you could go back in time, start the development of the game. No, wait, number 10, not number 1. <laughs> that is number 10. That is number 10. Wait. That is number 10. In my, uh, on my thing, number 10 is the progenitor alien one. Uh, my version has it as number 10. 
Uh, you want the file that I put in the Skype chat, Magic? I did. What? It's got Dennis Shirk, senior producer for Access Games. No, 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 no. You're looking at the previous... Uh, I'm, looking at the an- I'm looking at the answers, not the... What? What am I looking at? You want the PDF file that I sent? Yeah. Redownload it or resend it to him or something, because he's definitely got the wrong file. Oh, or is, that was it? No, that was our... I was wondering why some of the answers actually look similar. That was the... Uh, ah, right, right. Okay. Never mind. Hold on. Now he gets it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the previous top ten. No. Oh. Yeah. This question was by Lord Tyrion. Yeah, I said, said that. that. Scott did say that did this time, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pay attention. Go no. get more coffee. Imagine gets the wrong list to start with. <laughs> just, I tell you what, what are you doing over there, Imagine? <laughs> Record date November twenty second, two thousand fourteen. Faraxicon Clips Copyright Two K Games. Civilization 4, 5, and Beyond Earth Sound Clips, copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.